Good morning. Oh, good morning. Today is February 7th, and we're going to start with a daily reflection on the New Testament. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Of all the words that might describe the work of the master, he was, first and foremost, a teacher. He testified, he preached, he imparted gospel truths. He opened the minds and hearts of men and women to sacred things and directed their lives toward infinite and eternal verities. Through his touch and by the power of his word, many were healed and their physical of their physical afflictions. His teachings filled with the spirit of truth, were themselves a healing balm to aching hearts. He spoke the pleasing word of God, the word which healeth the wounded soul. Okay, so today is John chapter 2. My eyes would focus. Yes, John chapter 2. Um, and in this, we have the beginning of his miracles. Um... He, his mother, and his uh, apostles are at a wedding, and um, they run out of wine, and his mother comes to him and says, um, they're out of wine, and he goes, he says, woman, what have I to do with thee, uh, or what have I to do with you, something, I just, I think it's hilarious, I know it's not, it's not how it's coming off in reality, but I just think, it, woman, what have I to do with you or thee? I just think it's funny. And anyways, he says, my time has not yet come. My time to do my ministry, my time to start my preaching, to show forth this is not yet come. So you kind of wonder if perhaps him preaching in the temple comes later where he says this day is a scripture fulfilled. You're wondering if it comes later because he says, my time has not yet come. Um, but anyways, he does it. Um, his mother says to the servants of the house, do whatever he says. They fill up water vessels as he tells them to. And then, oh, and then, um, and then it turns into wine and it's the best wine of the feast. Then he goes to Capernaum. And his mother and his brethren and his apostles or disciples follow him. And you're thinking, okay, his mom and his brothers, where's his dad? I'm thinking maybe his father has passed away by this time. And that's why his mother is with him all the time. He has charge over her. He has care over her. Um, my assumptions, my, my wonderings. Um... And then, uh, and then, oh, and then he throws the people out of the temple. He sees the money changers, the merchandisers, the people selling pigeons. He makes a cord. Uh, when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Um, a whip of some kind and it says do not turn my house my father's house into a house of merchandise um, then answered the Jews and said unto him what sign showest thou unto us seeing that thou dost these things um, and uh, he says unto them though this temple was built over time it shall be destroyed and I will raise it up again in three days. And they say, but it took 40 and six years to build this temple. But he was talking about his body, his own resurrection, and they understood not. But after he was resurrected, his disciples remembered the sayings. Um, uh, and that's basically it for chapter two. Um... Let's see. 
Okay, verse 4. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what will thou have me do for thee? That I, that will I do, for mine hour is not yet come. Um, that's the Joseph Smith translation, and it adds quite a bit, which makes more sense. And you wonder why. Why were these things taken out? Why were these things lost? The noun of address, woman, as applied by the son to his mother, may sound in our ears somewhat harsh, if not disrespectful, but its use was really an expression of opposite import. To every son, the mother ought to be preeminently the woman of, wo the woman of women. She is the one woman in the world to whom the son owes his earthly existence, and though the title mother belongs to every woman, who has earned the honors of maternity, yet to no child there is no, yet to no child is there more than one woman whom by natural right he can address by that title of respect respectful acknowledgement when in the last dread scenes of his mortal existence Christ hung in dying agony upon the cross he looked down upon the weeping Mary, his mother, and commanded her to the care of the beloved Apostle John with the words, Woman, behold thy son. Can it be thought that in this supreme moment our Lord's concern for the mother from whom he was about to be separated by death was associated with any emotion other than that of honor, tenderness, and love? Now, that makes a lot of sense. And I kind of... I like that. See, and that's the important thing about knowing about um, backstory and cultural things. Is that you're like, when somebody says woman nowadays, you're like, that's a little, that's a little harsh. That's a little disrespectful. Um, but here it's a sign of respect, utmost respect. Um... Um, in verse 6, it says a firkin is about nine gallons. Thus, each of the six water pots contained about 18 to 27 gallons of water, with the result that Jesus then created between 100 and 150 gallons of wine, a miracle showing that the wedding celebration was quite large. Um... We could talk about the uh, temple. Ancient Israel in the days of Moses was freed from temporal bondage in Egypt by the Lord Jehovah. To commemorate this deliverance, they were commanded to keep the feast of the Passover. The feast was designed to bring two things to their remembrance. One, that the angel of death passed over the houses and flocks of Israel while slaying the firstborn among the, of, among the men and beasts of the Egyptians. And two, that Jehovah was the deliverer, <clears throat> the same holy being who in due course would come into the world as King Messiah to work out the infinite and eternal atonement. All of the symbols of the feast centered around these two events. The feast, more so in the days of its inception than in the time of Jesus, was eaten in haste as though pre preparatory to flight. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the sacrificial lamb was one without blemish, whose blood was shed, but whose bones were not broken. Blood was sprinkled on the houses to be spared, all of which provided types and symbols for Messiah's coming mortal sacrifice. And now nearly two millennium and a half after Jehovah came, gave the Passover to Israel, he himself, tabernacled among men, was preparing to celebrate the feast to fulfill the law given to Moses. The incident of Christ's forcible clearing of the temple is a contradiction of the traditional conception of him as of one so gentle and unassertive in demeanor as to appear unmanly. 
gentle he was and patient under affliction, merciful and long-suffering in dealing with the contrite sinners, yet stern and inflexible in the presence of hypocrisy and unsparing in his denunciation of persistent evildoers. His mood was adapted to the conditions to which he addressed himself, tender words of encouragement or burning expletives of righteous indignation issued with equal fluency from his lips. His nature was no poetic conception of cheru cherubic sweetness ever present, but that of a man with the emotions and passions essential to manhood and manliness. He who often wept with compassion at other times evinced in word and action the righteous anger of god but of all his passions however gently they rippled or strongly surged he was ever master contrast the gentle jesus moved to hospitable service by the needs of a festival party in cana with the indignant christ plying his whip and amidst commotion and turmoil of his own making driving cattle and men before him as an unclean herd. Uh, it goes on and on and on, and I'm not going to keep going because we still have other things to read in this chapter, but um, I think sometimes people only want to portray Christ in his mortal life as the Son of God, but he is also mortal, he does have mortal feelings, mortal emotions, and it's okay that he uses them. It's okay that we use them. Um, Joseph Smith translation for verse 22. Then when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Uh, Joseph Smith translation changes believed to remembered. Only after the resurrection did the full and complete meaning of Jesus' announcement of, the, of his coming resurrection dawn upon his disciples. Then they remembered that the Lord Jehovah, the God of Israel himself, after his birth into mortality, was to die and be resurrected. They remembered that Isaiah had said of him, He was cut off out of the land of the living. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. They remembered that the great Jehovah had said to Israel, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. You kind of wonder um, what his disciples thought of him, you know, because Jews believe in the coming Messiah. That's something they've been taught from the very beginning. There will be a Messiah. He will come. And he continually says to them, I am that Messiah. I am that person. I am the I am the Christ. But continually, they they don't remember. They don't believe. After he's risen, they're like, oh, yeah, we've been taught that this Messiah is supposed to come and he's supposed to be born and crucified and die and be raised again. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was the Christ. Like, who do you think they thought he was while he was with them? All right, it is the seventh. I will leave you with a prayer from a diary of prayer. It looks like we have two today, one from Confessions of St. Augustine and one from Carol Houselander. You, God of my love, are the life of souls, the life of lives, livingness itself, and you shall not change, O life of my soul. We are the mediocre, we are the half givers, we are the half lovers, we are the we are the savorless salt. 
Lord Jesus Christ, rest us now, restore us now to the primal splendor of first love, to the austere light of the breaking day. Let us hunger and thirst. Let us burn in the flame. Break the hard crust of complacency. Quicken in us the sharp grace of desire. That has some, that has some uh, thoughts in it. We are the mediocre. We are the half givers. We are the half lovers. We are the savorless salt. Let us hunger and thirst. Let us burn in the flame. Break the hard crust of complacency. Quicken in us the sharp grace of desire. All right. That was John chapter 2. And tomorrow we do Learn of Me chapter 20. We will see you then. Bye.